Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you again, um, everybody, for joining us for today's webinar um, hosted by Richie May. Um, just a reminder, the webinar is 2018 Cybersecurity and Technology Trends. So before we get started and I introduce our presenter for today, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items. I uh, just wanted to let you know you were all placed on mute during the webinar. Um, we will try to reserve some time towards the end of the presentation to address any questions that you might have. So if you would, please um, please type those into the questions dashboard on uh, GoToWebinar, and we will receive those throughout the webinar and, and try to address those at the end. If we don't have time to address all your questions, we will follow up with you directly afterwards, so no worries there. Um, we'll, we'll get get you via email or our phone. And also a, a recording of today's webinar and the slide deck will be emailed to everybody who participated today. So look for that in the next day or two. So with that, let me go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Uh, today's presenter is JT Gaietto. He is our Executive Director of Cybersecurity Services here at Ritchie May. JT has nearly 20 years of experience providing enterprise information security and risk management services to a variety of organizations with a particular emphasis on the financial services industry. He's been a certified information system security professional since 2003, and he holds an undergraduate degree in computer information systems from Northern Arizona University. Uh, JT and his team here at Ritchie May focus on how to provide value to organizations while reducing risk. So JT is going to share a little bit more about what he does here at Richie May and, and the, the issues in cybersecurity here in 2018. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for joining our webinar, uh, web webinar today. Uh, and for many of you, it's in the afternoon. For some of you, it, it's uh, lunchtime. So uh, thanks again. So jumping into this, uh, what is uh, cybersecurity? I get to ask this a lot, and it's really the confluence of people, process, and technology. And cyber attacks uh, have been focused on financial services for a very long time, uh, mainly because the bad guys are uh, focused on where the money is. And as we've increased focus with um, you know, cryptocurrencies and different crypto funds uh, that have uh, a level of uh, anonymity to it, uh, the, the bad guys have also been attracted in that space. And the statistics that you see in front of you right now are actually from the 2018 Verizon Data Breach Report. And it's a report that uh, Verizon uh, Business Group puts out on an annual basis. And they analyze uh, cyber attacks by industry and how they, uh, you know, not only how, they, how what industry is impacted, but also uh, how much the cost of re remediation is for uh, an incident. And in 2017, they found that nearly 20% of all cyber attacks uh, have been focused on financial services companies, mostly small to mid-sized firms, uh, including hedge funds and other investment services groups. And again, the, the reason for that is because they, the bad guys have found that uh, small to mid-sized uh, firms uh, don't spend uh, nearly as much capital as the money center banks. Uh, and the report actually continued to go through and state that on average, the cost of a lost record uh, costs the firm $154. Um, and on the surface, it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you start thinking about uh, the Equifax breach that occurred last year, uh, they lost somewhere along the lines of around 146 million records. Um, and so when you start multiplying that out, obviously the losses uh, equate into the billions. And so it can be very impactful for uh, a small to mid-market uh, company to sustain those types of losses. Digging into it a little bit deeper, uh, the, the Office of the, the President of the United States has a group of economic advisors that also looks at the costs of uh, malicious cyber activity and how it impacts the U.S. economy. Now, their report's actually even further behind. The report they just released in 2018 looks at the year of 2016, and they found that the losses uh, that, that have the U.S. economy sustained just due to cyber malicious cyber activity was between $57 billion and $109 billion in damages. And that's a pretty wide variance. And the report goes through and talks about why that variance occurs. And, and for the vast majority, it's because small to mid-sized organizations that have had impacts have a hard time quantifying what, what, what the damages truly were. Uh, some firms don't report that they've had a cybersecurity breach. 
or incident. And then in addition to that, um, the, the, the ongoing um, cleanup can, can occur over a multi-year period, and so that can also uh, push those losses higher. And so that, 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 that's what causes that variance. They've also gone through and found that, that nearly on a global scale, nearly $600 billion in damages were lost in 2016. And I'm sure if we look at what happened in 2017 when this report comes out next year, that number is going to continue to increase. And what we're seeing is just the interconnected nature of financial services companies, especially investment firms, is that you know, you're only as strong as the other individuals within your, your uh, food chain. And so cybersecurity really is, as, as they point in the report, a common good. Um, because one, one organization that you do business with that has lax cybersecurity practices could actually lead to far reaching consequences for your firm or for your customers. Uh, another survey that was just recently completed um, talked about companies that, that have had cybersecurity breaches and they found that nearly half the comp they, they looked at 400 mid market financial services companies and they found that nearly half of them uh, had a security incident uh, that not only uh, impacted their technical systems, but it impacted their productivity. Uh, and that's a key piece uh, because at the end of the day, if you can't keep the quote unquote cash register open, um, that, that affects the bottom line uh, for many of uh, the investment companies that we talk to. Uh, in addition to that, they found that 65% of the companies that, that they surveyed had at least a single cybersecurity incident over the past year. And I think a key differential here is to understand the difference between a cybersecurity incident and a cybersecurity breach. And so many of you actually may have had an incident and that could be a computer failure, it could be a loss of internet connectivity uh, and leading to uh, the inability to do trading or other financial transactions, all the way down to a malicious actor compromising your your systems, stealing information, or maybe even encrypting everything. Uh, th those are all different types of incidents. Now, if they're able to steal information from you uh, or compromise the privacy of your clients or your, your portfolios, that's really when it becomes a breach. Um, and the other thing that I thought was interesting out of this, this research report was that they, they said nearly a third of the organizations that they had talked to were looking at adopting new technology uh, to improve their cybersecurity, such as cloud computing. And so that's really the concept of moving from your internal systems that you may have either in your back office or, or co-location center and adopting something like Microsoft Azure or Amazon AWS uh, because of the additional cybersecurity capacity that those platforms bring to the table. When we start looking at the trends and what we're seeing uh, investment firms faced with, it, you know, we start talking about a term that we call threat landscape. And the, the same uh, office uh, or economic advisors of the Office of the Presidency, uh, the CSIS, they, they built out these st statistics. And what they found was what I think is very uh, staggering. Um, on, on the scale, I think everybody here on this call has seen a phishing email. And what they estimated was that there was 33,000 different phishing campaigns conducted on a daily basis. And we know from our experience working with our clients across the US that on average, um, when, when doing uh, phishing testing, so that's where uh, you, you send emails out to your employees that, that are, are known to be bad, but they're, they're faked by yourself just to see how, how well your organization uh, detects these types of things. Uh, the average click-through rate is about 10%. Um, and, and in really good organizations, you might get it down to 5%. But the reality of it is, is that someone's going to click there. And so when you do the math on 33,000 different campaigns, uh, that, that's a good number of organizations that are getting fished on a daily basis and employees that are either giving up passwords to the bad guys, downloading malicious attachments that lead to ransomware, um, or, or one of the, the more common ones that we're seeing now um, is the loss of, of username and passwords, and then the bad guys uh, impersonate those uh, individuals through their, their uh, webmail. So, and that, that is called business email compromise. And they'll sit there and start monitoring the different financial transactions that are going on within the firm, 
and then uh, reach out to the customers or the other recipients uh, that expecting uh, some sort of return so they can have them wire money or, or transfer funds. And so all of these different things have led to uh, an ongoing trend, uh, and that trend throughout 2018 is is really been increased regulation. Uh, you know, investment firms are very familiar with uh, the SEC, and they came out with cybersecurity guidance. And really, the, the root of that guidance is that firms have to conduct what they call a periodic assessment of threats and risks. And, and you know, many other um, regulatory agencies call that an annual risk assessment. And that's really where uh, either an internal or uh, independent third party would come in to an organization and talk to different individuals within the firm and ask them about where they see uh, risks, uh, not only risks to the, to the business, risks to the proprietary information, uh, maybe it's, it's font information or some other type of uh, proprietary uh, investment uh, tools that they're using to, you know, uh, develop their portfolio. Um, but ultimately, you want to capture if something were to happen, what what would impact, you know, again, that, that concept of keeping the cash register open. Uh, they have to, firms have to have a formal strategy around how to prevent, detect, and respond to cybersecurity incidents. And this is something we talk to with clients quite frequently. It's not, a lot of people focus on, focus on the prevention uh, aspect, and that's through a lot of uh, different technology tools, either through antivirus software or patching or things of that nature. But one of the other items that's very, very important is how you respond to these incidents. And an organization that doesn't have a good strategy that's documented and it's been you know, formally tested uh, find that it's pretty difficult to, to accurately execute when uh, an incident actually occurs. And if you think about the, the slide that we had up earlier, um, you know, out of those 400 companies, nearly 65% of them had an incident. Um, you know, the, the odds of you having an incident and, and really uh, leveraging a documented strategy are pretty high. Um, the other things that the SEC talks about is having a, a, a formal business continuity and disaster recovery strategy. Uh, and again, this is that, again looking at that concept of how do we keep the cash register open? We protect the information that we have to, to conduct our business, um, but we also need to make sure that our employees are safe. Uh, and so that you know, if, if you're in the southeast right now, uh, you know, we're looking at, at uh, Hurricane Michael coming up the coast. You, you might be thinking about how am I going to have people work remote or work from home? Um, how am I going to make sure that my data is safe in the event that we have some flooding? Things of that nature. Um, they, they require that you implement cybersecurity training. Uh, in, in 2018, there's a lot of firms that provide very inexpensive cybersecurity training online uh, that, that either uh, your employees can, can conduct through their direct website or it's content you can download and send out through periodic emails. Uh, but it's very cost effective and, and, and you know, you're talking less than you know, $15, $20 a year uh, per employee. Um, and then you have to ensure that senior management is aware of all associated cybersecurity issues. And this, I think, is an interesting trend that we're going to see as we talk about some of the other regulations that have come out, is that uh, in the past, it, it's been very easy for, for firms and organizations to task one person being responsible for cybersecurity um, and not really make it a senior leadership issue. Uh, given the, 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 ten, the trends that we're seeing and the impacts that they're having, not only to organizations, but to consumers in general. Uh, you know, the federal government's making it a, a mandatory requirement that the, the leadership of the organization uh, is aware of all the problems going on. So no, no longer can you delegate this away um, and, and just get periodic updates. You, you really have to be aware when they're, where the problems are and when they're happening. The second uh, organization was the National Futures Association. They have some compliance rules, and these compliance rules have actually been out for some time, but it just recently gotten resurfaced. And you know, again, there's there's some interesting trends that they that they bring up in their compliance rules. Uh, the first being you have to have a, uh, a written information security program. Uh, a lot of organizations also call this a WISP, 
Uh, and that term is actually from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, so if you do business in the state of Massachusetts from a financial services perspective, you too are also subject to having a written information security program that has formal policies and procedures around how you're going to identify risk, uh, reduce that risk, and respond when you have an incident. You also have to conduct an annual risk assessment, similar to what the SEC requires. Uh, they go a little bit uh, further down the path and, and, and make the recommendations around having protective measures deployed uh, against known threats and vulnerabilities. And, and these different technology tools, as I mentioned, are, are things that are preventative. So that's firewalls, patch management, uh, network access control is one that they mentioned, antivirus, web filtering. And I left multi-factor authentication for last because that's, uh, in, in this year alone, out of the nearly dozen incidents that we've helped clients with, uh, all but one multi-factor authentication was prevented. And, and that, that's really how impactful that, that solution is. So if, if your organization uh, hasn't implemented multi-factor authentication and you're using tools like Microsoft Office 365 for your email, it's something that's actually included uh, in most of the, the purchase tiers, you should turn it on because it, it really does reduce your risk of a cybersecurity breach or incident as it relates to your email platform. Uh, again, similar to what the SEC mentioned, uh, senior management has to be aware of all associated cybersecurity issues. Uh, so no longer can you just delegate this away, um, and as well as they, they require employee cybersecurity training. And I'll just mention as we continue to walk through these, these uh, different regulatory requirements, there's a lot of overlap and themes that we're, we're going to see here around having documented policies and procedures, senior management involvement, and, and uh, employee training. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or the CFTC, also has uh, a list of cybersecurity system safeguards requirements. Um, they require all the entities uh, must conduct quarterly internal and external vulnerability scans. Uh, frequently, uh, our clients talk about vulnerability testing and penetration testing as one and the same, and they're actually quite different. Um, vulnerability testing or vulnerability scanning is designed to identify issues within your environment um, that, that you haven't fixed, such as uh, software patches that need to be installed. And that's something that you should be doing periodically just to make sure that some of your other controls are functioning uh, correctly. When you start talking about a penetration test, the idea behind those types of tests is to have an independent third party act as a malicious actor and try to actually hack into your, your environment. Um, and that's something that really should be done just on an annual basis. And the reason I say just on an annual basis is that um, you know, doing it too frequently doesn't yield uh, what I would call uh, actionable results. Uh, and frequently when you had one of these tests completed, uh, if there are any findings, it can take some time to, to um, implement remediation. And so uh, on an annual basis is, is what I would deem is sufficient for most firms. Um, you also have to have IT general controls testing, um, and that frequency has to be based on the inherent risk of your organization. And that's a pretty broad definition based on your inherent risk. And so, so I've seen some regula uh, regulators look at the inherent risk of a, a firm based on your portfolio size. Uh, I've seen other uh, regulators look at it based on headcount. And so, it, you know, it really does depend on how you want to quantify risk for your uh, internal firm uh, and, and really how do you justify the cost uh, around putting some of these different tools and processes in place. Uh, but you really do have to have someone look at that on an annual basis. And this, this could be, uh, from a formal perspective, it could be looking at someone that, uh, that does a SOC report for you, um, or it could just be an independent third party that's going to review your, your uh controls that you've defined in your written information security program uh, and, and see how you're actually delivering on that. Additionally, you have to have a security incident response plan that's been tested uh, on at least an annual basis. Uh, again, similar to what the SEC mentioned, you have to be able to uh, have a, a formal strategy and plan to move forward in the event that you have a problem. Uh, and then you also have to conduct an annual enterprise risk assessment. And, and this is a theme that you're going to see with pretty much every regulatory body asks for an organization to have an annual risk assessment completed. 
So for many of you, uh, this may not be applicable, but I bring this up because uh, as we talk to clients, uh, especially since uh, the beginning of 2018, um, GDPR is the European data privacy uh, law that went into effect in May 25th of this year. Um, but it may impact you, and you might not know it, um, if your fund is servicing or collecting consumer information um, from citizens of the EU. And we actually just got, uh, I, I just attended a, a GDPR uh, regulatory event two days ago. And out of that, the, 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 the lawyers there actually added an additional piece of emphasis here. Just because the individual is a citizen of the EU, um, it's also dependent on where they're residing at the time of the transaction. So uh, what that means is if you have uh, an investor that you're working with in your fund today, but they reside in New York, even though they're a European citizen, uh, the GDPR does not apply to them. However, if you've got an investor in, in, in your portfolio today that resides in the European Union um, and, and you're doing transactions along with them, that's when GDPR becomes impactful for you. And so that's, that's a key differentiator uh, that I think has is, is been a, a good qualifier uh, that they, they just got back from Brussels just recently. Um, a couple of the other things that the GDPR requires is that you have to encrypt uh, all data, all consumer data that you collect, and that's not just in transit, but also wherever you store it. And your incident response plan has to give you the capabilities of, of letting um, Brussels know that you've had a cybersecurity incident, and that's not a breach, that you've had an incident within 72 hours of the, uh, of the issue. And so when you start looking at your, your, your written information security program and your incident response program, you have to have, uh, or it's recommended that you have a line in there uh, of contacting uh, the European Union uh, Council uh, and letting them know that you've had a, a, an incident. When you're, the penalty for non-compliance is actually pretty steep. Um, it's, up, it's up to 2% uh, or it's 2% of your annual revenue in the past year, up to 10 million euros. And so uh, while we haven't seen anybody uh, get hit with that civil penalty or with that, that penalty yet, uh, because this, this regulatory requirement is fairly new, um, it, it is uh, something to be cognizant of that if, if you're uh, doing business with citizens that reside in the European Union, um, that, that you're subject to these, these requirements. Uh, for those of you that are licensed in the state of New York, this shouldn't be a, a surprise to you. Um, the, you know, the, the New York State Department of Financial Services created their own cybersecurity requirements. And for many, uh, this is now the gold standard. I've talked to a uh, half dozen different attorneys across the United States, and they, they have all said that even if a firm's not subject to NYDFS because of where they reside or do business, um, many other regulators are seeing this as the, the new gold standard on what is considered reasonable security controls. And so, you know, again, that looks at having multi-factor authentication in your environment uh, for anywhere you remotely access data, uh, encrypting all your devices, including your laptops and your, your smartphones. Um, and it requires uh, companies to name a chief information security officer. Uh, and that's, that's something that I think is worth looking at. So again, not only uh, do they go out and say you have to have a, a chief information security officer, but that's someone that's going to report to senior management and keep them apprised of the different things that are going on within uh, the organization that could potentially impact their cybersecurity risk. Um, on the state front, we're seeing uh, some interesting things come out as well. Uh, Arizona just recently expanded their data breach notification law, uh, and that updated to the legislation ultimately adds civil penalties for consumers that have had their personally identifiable information lost. Uh, and, and that's up to uh, anywhere from $10,000 to $500,000, and that's per incident. And so in the event, uh, if you look back at the Equifax issue, uh, what, what has been discovered is that they actually had uh, three different cybersecurity incidents over that five month period. And so if, if you were to apply the Arizona law to that, um, you know, consumers could potentially sue Equifax up to $500,000 uh, multiple times uh, for any negative uh, impacts that they've suffered from having their data lost. So that's a pretty uh, important thing to be cognizant of is that we're starting to see, now Arizona is one of the first, 
uh, to come out with civil penalties that consumers can, can sue uh, for loss of their, their personal identifiable information, but I don't think they're going to be the last. Um, you know, Colorado also recently expanded their privacy and cybersecurity law, um, and again, you know, this, this term of maintaining reasonable security controls around personally identifiable information of Colorado residents. Um, so many of you may not even realize that you're subject to some of these uh, data protection provisions um, because investors within your portfolio, um, their states may require you to protect them based on that state's regulatory requirements because they reside there. So it's something to be cognizant of uh, when you're building your incident response strategy on what some of the different states uh, in the U.S. require. Um, an another big piece of what uh, the, the Colorado uh, law brings to the table is that companies actually have to have a defined control uh, mechanism around how they handle data with, that they collect. Um, and that's really a big deal and because a lot of the, the, the firms that we do business with and talk to uh, quite frequently, to put it uh, in a less eloquent way, are data hoarders, right? So they, they collect information uh, from investors and while those investors may no longer be part of that fund, uh, they retain that indefinitely uh, for either marketing purposes or other you know, uh, analytical uh, purposes. And, and really, going forward, the more data that you retain, um, the harder and harder it's going to be to qualify what the impact is if you do have a breach or an incident. And so it's really just good uh, business sense to start having a, a, an idea about when, a, when are we going to start you know, deleting information uh, we're, we're, when are we going to, you know, destroy, you know, paper records, things of that nature? Because over time, uh, I think more and more states are going to uh, require you to also have a defined life cycle policy in place. Um, this is one that's been on the books for quite some time, uh, but it's worth bringing up uh, for, for, for the very reason around what's underneath the safeguard rules, and that's uh, Graham Leach Bliley. And so the GLBA uh, looks at any organization irregardless of their size, that's engaged in providing financial products or services to consumers in the U.S. And so, you know, as an investment firm, you know, that, that puts you square in the middle of that. And under the safeguards rules, that, again, you know, they have this ambiguity around taking reasonable steps that ensures the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of consumers' non-public financial information. And so, if we look back at what you know, the feedback we're seeing from uh, the attorney space today is that uh, New York now is the reasonable safeguards requirement, right? So that would mean encryption of consumer data, multi-factor authentication for all remote access, consistent patch management in your environment, um, as well as the deployment of something like a, a, an endpoint security tool like EDR, and that's uh, a tool that's designed to detect and respond to malicious behavior on an endpoint, not just detect it like traditional antivirus software, as well as conducting an annual risk assessment. And so these are things that, that you really need to be thinking of um, that you, you know, not only on, on a state level, but on a federal level that, that over time what's deemed reasonable is gonna to continue to evolve based on, you know, what other states like the state of New York might bring to the table saying you will do the specific things because this is how we know we can protect consumers. So shifting gears a little bit, we start talking about the second trend that we've seen uh, going through 2018, and that's uh, one that I briefly mentioned earlier, and that's email fraud and ransomware. So in 2017, ransomware really was the, the hot topic, and, and as you, if you look at the graph there that's provided by um, a company called Proofpoint, Really, ransomware took off late uh, Q4 2015. It grew through 2016, um, but really 2017 was was the year that we saw a lot of headlines associated with it. And that's where the bad guys will will try to get somebody to click on an attachment or click on a link that downloads software that will just encrypt all your data. And then they'll they'll put a nice little bright sign up on your screen saying, "Hey, all your data is encrypted now. Uh, pay us." you know, one or two Bitcoins and we'll give you the keys back to your, your information. What, uh, what we've seen is uh, an actual trend in, in moving away from that. And I think two reasons for that. One, uh, as, as Bitcoin has uh, you know, been devalued since its peak in December of last year, uh, that's 
uh, the attackers have, have changed their their approach. Um, but but the second thing I think that it, that is drawn out of this is that the bad guys have started getting a bad name for themselves, ironically enough, because they weren't actually giving the keys back to people that were paying the ransoms. Uh, so early on uh, in these these ransomware issues, the bad guys would say, "Hey, okay, pay us a Bitcoin. We'll give you the, the password to get back into your data," and they would you know do that and close the loop. Uh, what we started seeing in early 2018 is that as more and more of these bad actors started coming to market uh, with their ransomware product, if you will, uh, they were just taking the money and running. And so uh, I think that that for whatever it's worth has devalued the effectiveness of, of this type of attack. Uh, and so they are really moving more towards business email compromise and using your actual email accounts to commit fraud. Um, and they, they do this uh, and the, the, the big increase we've seen around that, right, and one of the statistics that you see on your screen there is that there's been nearly a 30% increase uh, in email fraud uh, starting in, since the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, and so that, that's really the, the big tremendous change and shift we're seeing away from ransomware into email fraud. And so, again, you know, if we say 2017 was the year of ransomware, 2018 is the year of business of what we've now started calling the business email compromise. And this uh, illustration here on the slide that you're looking at uh, really walks through uh, what an attack scenario would look like uh, in a business email compromise. Uh, so initially, uh, the bad guys are gonna identify a target and that's after um, they, they, you know, they may look at your, your fund or, or uh, other individuals within your circle and, and identify them as saying, hey, this, this is a great company that we can compromise. And so they're either gonna, uh, one, one of the ways they do that is through a process called password stuffing. And that's where they download large lists of passwords uh, and, and try to reuse your password uh, that you may have used on a different site, such as Facebook, uh, which recently announced that they had a, a, an incident uh, just not even two weeks ago, uh, 50 million accounts, uh, and their associated passwords were lost. And so for many people, they're like, okay, so my, my Facebook account's been compromised, so what? Well, what, what the bad guys will do is they'll download these, these 50 million accounts, and they'll, they'll, you know, once they've identified a target, if they can find any kind of overlap in your name, they'll try those passwords against your remote uh, email platform, you know, be it Gmail or Office 365. And once they're in, that's when the second step happens, and that's what, what's called grooming, right? And within that grooming process, the bad guys will look at all your sent messages and really try to identify any open business relationships that you have uh, going right, right at that very moment um, and, and identify how you talk to that individual, uh, what, what the size of, of the, the deal is with that individual, and what they'll start doing is really trying to practice how to uh, develop an email that looks just like you, which really gets into the third step, and that's where they're gonna impersonate you. Uh, and, and they really do pay attention to things such as how you sign an email. Uh, and so for instance, uh, for, for internal communications, I might just put my initials down uh, on, on my signature line, but for formal emails that when I work with customers outside of our organization, I might have my formal email signature. They pay attention to those little nuances and, and they, they develop the email in step three uh, to focus on how to, to instruct the, you know, the individual that you're doing business with to take out an action for them. And typically that's step four, right? And that's the wire transfer piece. And that's where they convince uh, you know, the, 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 the recipient of your email um, to, to do something for them. We just recently, uh, last week, responded to an, uh, an incident uh, for, for a customer uh, where they, they, uh, their payroll provider was compromised. So, you know, if, you, if anybody outsourced payroll services to a company like ADP or Paylocity, um, that firm had their account representative email compromised. And what happened was the bad guy sat through and groomed. And our, our client, who, who was the victim of this, um, just recently got a new senior leader in their organization. And so obviously you can think through the process there. HR person emails the payroll people to say, hey, we're, we, we just hired a new C-level executive. Um, here's his banking information. 
please set him up in payroll and we're going to pay him uh, uh, you know on the first of the month and you know their their outsourced payroll provider uh, you know obliges well that that uh, representative's email was compromised the bad guy sent an email back to the HR person saying hey um, sorry we didn't get the, the correct wiring information for your new uh, executive can you please send it again they said yep sure and so what they did is they inserted themselves in that process and then with, within that thread they forwarded it to somebody else within the, the payroll company because again they're, they're emailing their downstream client and they're emailing people within the payroll company and uh, ultimately what was interesting is they changed the wiring instructions for that executive so when his payroll run completed on, on the first uh, his, his paycheck was deposited in the bad guy's account uh, and he didn't get a check so uh, they're currently trying to sort out who's responsible for those missing funds but ultimately um, that is what a business email compromise does. It, it, it enables the bad guys to impersonate you and get someone to wire money uh, on, on their behalf. Uh, and it's got some staggering price tags around it, right? As, as the statistics show here, uh, the average loss is around $130,000. Um, and and it, it's led to nearly $12 billion in losses uh, since it started in 2013. But really, 2018, you know, with, with the 150% increase that we've seen, uh, targeting financial services companies uh, is, has really been the growth year for this attack. Um, you know, one of the other uh, case studies that I think is worth pointing out here uh, is Voya Financial. Uh, they recently just settled for $1 million with the SEC because uh, they violated both the red flags rule and the safeguards rule. Um, and what happened in the Voya incident was that in 2016, they had attackers that impersonated uh, customers uh, within Voya, and they were requesting passwords to be reset. So again, uh, investors in the fund asking for their password to the portal to be reset, uh, and Voya wasn't actually doing any due diligence to validate the person calling for a password to be reset was actually who they said they were. And so for, for many of us, when we you know do a financial transaction, we find it extremely, extremely frustrating that hey, we need to do this transaction, and they start asking us questions like our social security number or our mother's maiden name or, you know, take your pick of all the other different qualifying questions you might get. Um, Voya wasn't doing any of that, right? They were getting a request, hi, I'm a customer, here's my uh, account ID, I need my password reset, and they were just resetting it. And so what, what happened then is that once the bad guys figured this out, they were able to open up additional fraudulent accounts uh, using that victim's information, right? And, and, it, and it was not just a couple individuals, it was 5,600 different customers over six days. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, the other learning lesson here is that when the bad guys figure out there's a weak link, um, they call all their buddies uh, over and they, and they literally exploit it as fast as they possibly can because they know the window of opportunity is very small. Um, the, you know, I, I'm recently attended a, an FBI expose on these different types of, of fraud. And, and long story short, a lot of these bad guys go to jobs in, in Eastern Europe in an office building. And they literally just walk through and when someone gets a hit, they walk over to a group of cubicles and say, hey, we found a good target, let's, let's just go execute. And that's, that's how these guys make their money. Uh, another case study, and this is an internal case study uh, for one of our clients. Uh, and they were uh, experiencing an increase in wire fraud emails going out from email accounts of their executive leadership team. So it wasn't just one uh, executive, it was actually two. Um, and initially they thought someone had just stolen their email domain um, when, they, when they first called us. But what we found was that the users in question uh, were using the same password for both their personal accounts and their professional accounts. Uh, and it was just after a recent uh, one of those recent breaches that hit the news, um, this one in particular, I can't remember if it was Uber or uh, LinkedIn or, or who it was, but um, they, they literally used the same password on one of these public sites uh, as well as for their professional day-to-day -day work. And so the bad guys figured that out. They logged in through their Office 365 remote email portal, and they sat there literally what we found for 90 days uh, during that grooming period, and they literally uh, the best way that I can illustrate this picture is that they, for anyone that's seen the, A Beautiful Mind, 
they, they literally just strung all the different thoughts and people involved with these different financial transactions together. And then they picked a day to attack, right? And they had already crafted up all the request emails. They signed the, uh, the emails uh, to look just, just as the, the victims had, would have sent them out. Uh, and they started systematically saying, hey, uh, we've moved up the closing date for this deal. Uh, we need the funding transferred to this account instead. Or, hey, uh, quick ch change in plans. Please uh, fund uh, the deal to this account. Or if you really want to get invested here on this portfolio, please move the money to this account. And so they, they really uh, uh, pulled the lever, if you will, uh, very quickly and swiftly. And thankfully, the way that our client was turned on to it was that one of the recipients of the emails thought, boy, this is actually kind of odd. We thought we had multiple weeks to, to procure the funds for deposit, not a couple of days. Uh, and so they were initially agitated, and that's why they called. Uh, and that's, that's what turned us on to it. And we were able to uh, stop the attack. And thankfully, we were able to recall all the funds that were transferred out. But in many cases, uh, if the funds go directly overseas, that there's very little that, that a firm can do to get those monies back. So uh, transitioning to our third trend, and that's around uh, cloud and cloud security. And, and it, as you may remember from, from our earlier slide, nearly a third of uh, mid-market financial services companies are moving to the cloud. Uh, and, and 2017 was a, was a massive year for significant cloud growth. Uh, you know, Amazon, many people know Amazon as, as an online retailer, but truly the majority of their, their revenues actually come from their cloud services platform now called uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS. Uh, and they, they see continued growth, uh, as you see there on, in front of you, they had nearly 50% year-over-year growth uh, in, in 2017. Uh, they, throughout 2018, they're on that same trend. And Microsoft is also catching up. They had nearly 100% year-over-year growth from 16 to 17, uh, and they're, they're going to have uh, similar growth uh, in 18 as well. Um, but, but the big driver here is that you know, companies are looking to reduce their costs, but also enable their, their, their employees. And so in order to do that you know, and, and, and add, you know, add flexibility in the mobile environment that many of us operate in today, moving to the cloud just makes sense versus building all that infrastructure internal to your firm and then also have to pay someone to support it on a daily basis. Uh, KPMG uh, recently did a study in conjunction with Oracle, who also runs a cloud uh, services platform, uh, around what does a firm really feel the security in the cloud looks like. And 83% and of the respondents rated security within the cloud better than what they could develop in-house. Uh, and that's a trend that we, we see across the board. And, and it's not just the physical security element, um, but the process in which uh, firms have to walk through to get their data into the cloud, um, you know, adds additional layers of security. Um, but the, the trade-off is that, that uh, you also have to be aware that, that it's still a shared responsibility. You can't fully outsource uh, the security of your environment. When you move to the cloud, you're still responsible for, for, for part of it. And so um, while it does reduce your risks, especially around disaster recovery and business continuity, um, because when you're in the cloud, there, there's already a lot of built-in redundancy uh, with, within the environment. Your data is you know, back up, backed up and replicated to, to multiple data centers. Um, but because it's in the cloud, again, if you're unfortunately in the Southeast right now, uh, you, you, you wouldn't have to be worried about flooding for instance, because your, your data has been replicated across multiple data centers. It's not just sitting in, on a computer in your back office. Um, the, the other element, though, is you have to really think about third-party vendor management. And so while the cloud is, you know, when you're doing business with some of the bigger labels like Amazon or Microsoft or, or Oracle, um, a lot of that due diligence has been done uh, by, by other, you know, the big four or other auditors they hire. But with the cloud, you get a lot more flexibility and the ability to share data. And so as you're doing business with other third-party entities or at allowing them into your you know, private or personal cloud, you have to really make sure that they're also going to be good stewards of that information um, once they get access to it. And that's part of that shared responsibility that I mentioned. 
Um, another item that, that's worth mentioning is that the traditional idea of having a castle uh, with, with hard walls and having all your data inside of it, uh, that, that traditional centralized security model, it doesn't work on the cloud because uh, the, that castle doesn't exist, right? The data is in, on the internet and it's really about how, who, who can access it when and from where. Um, and you have to understand the product suite and how to configure it. Uh, there have been a lot of different uh, case studies released around early adopters of cloud technology like Amazon AWS uh, S3 storage. Uh, the U.S. government has had a lot of problems with losing things such as military bat battle plans because they weren't appropriately configured, configuring the storage. Um, and, and so it's really imperative that you understand what you're buying when you move to the cloud and how you configure it appropriately to add and remove people's access versus just saying, it's a, it's a headache, so we're just gonna give access to everybody. Um, and it's also worth highlighting that, that many of these vendors have effective solutions already included in, in the offerings that you purchase. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're an Office 365 email user, they have multi-factor authentication uh, for, for majority of the, 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 the product tiers that you can turn on today at no additional cost to secure your email portal. Um, so those are the types of things that, that you really need to be aware of uh, when, when you're working with these types of tools. Um, so the last trend uh, that, that I like getting into is around efficiency and enhancements, right? Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, I've spent all this money on cybersecurity. Uh, is, is there, you know, is there a there there? And my response is there's really no destination, right? It's, it's a continuously evolving uh, industry. Uh, the bad guys are constantly evolving on how that they can monetize their attack methods um, because ultimately, you know, what, what you're battling against is, is someone else that has made an investment uh, in an individual and they want to get a return on that investment. And that investment return comes from, you know, wire fraud um, and, and other different, you know, uh, cyber, cyber crime activities. And so how do you focus on efficiencies enhancements into your program in 2018 um, to control some of the costs associated with, with these types of programs. And so the first one uh, is around patch management. This is probably one of the oldest um, preventative measures that we've got in the toolbox, per se. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's one that we still struggle with. And it's not just if you use Microsoft products. Pretty much every third-party software platform out there today, regardless if it's Apple, Oracle, or Adobe, releases patches. And you need to make sure that you're patching the computers in your environment, your servers in your environment, and moving to, to cloud-based solutions, it does remove some of this responsibility, um, but, but only some of it. Uh, if we look back at the incident with Equifax, the reason they lost you know, almost 146 million different records was because they weren't patching their web servers. Um, and they, they knew, uh, you, you know, during the, the research, they found that uh, executive email saying they know they had to do the patching uh, they just weren't putting a priority on it. Um, and so that's that's really the, the key piece there is that a lot of people know they've got these problems. They're just not, you know, executing uh, in a timely manner. Another one, and, and you'd be surprised that I'm going to bring it up, right? Uh, Multi-factor authentication. It really is uh, one of the most uh, consistent uh, tools that we can use to reduce risk in, in today's environment. Um, it reduces the risk associated with your users sharing passwords. It reduces the number of calls that if you've got an IT support group that they've got to deal with because people forgot their passwords. Um, but more importantly, it reduces the risk for a bad guy to use your password against you to compromise your platform. Um, and it, the, today, these, these, there's a lot of different vendors in this space, um, but multi-factor is a fairly inexpensive solution uh, that, that yields a, a lot of promising results. The other one's encryption. Uh, if you know if you're encrypting information, make sure you're using at least AES-256. Um, if you've got Wi-Fi networks within your office uh, for all your smartphones and your laptops and everything else, make sure you're securing that that network with with WPA2 encryption. I would highly encourage anyone that's that's logging into any financial portals to never use a public Wi-Fi uh, uh, hotspot, either at a hotel or Starbucks. Uh, turn on the hotspot capability on your cell phone. Um, it, it's, it's really imperative because the bad guys can, can snoop on what's going on there otherwise. 
uh, considering uh, consider if you've got a, a public facing website or, or a, a portal for, for trading, make sure that it's using HTTPS so that that information while it's traveling over the internet is encrypted. Uh, another one to, to make sure that you're using uh, opportunistic encryption uh, on your email. Uh, and that's, if you're using a primary provider like Gmail or Office 365, uh, they already do this for you. But if you're still hosting your own email platform, it's something you might want to consider uh, your IT folks turn on for you. Uh, device encryption should be on by default, and that's not just on your smartphones, but on your laptops, uh, even your desktops now, because they're getting so small that people can walk away with these devices and, and take a lot of information with them. And make sure your backups are encrypted. Uh, you know, we talk to a lot of firms, and many of them are backing up their information for a business continuity purpose, but they're not actually encrypting that, that information. And those tapes sometimes go home in the, in the trunk of their IT guy because they don't send them off to somewhere like an Iron Mountain. And, you know, the IT guy loses the tapes. That, that could impact uh, your organization uh, in a negative way. And so with that, I wanted to, to thank you for your time and turn it over to see if we've got any uh, questions uh, or, or comments. So it doesn't look like we have any questions typed into the dashboard. Uh, I know JT went through a tremendous amount of information. If you don't have questions now, um, please do reach out to us um, following this, this uh, presentation. As I said, you will be getting the, the slide deck and the recording. We'll have contact information in there as well. Um, and so please do, as you kind of mull through this and maybe share this presentation with, with others, um, and, and questions come to mind, please do um, please please do send those our way and we will have JT follow up. Actually, I did get one question come in, or here we go, here we're getting a couple now. Um, let's see, the first one is, you re recommend using VPN if you have to use a public Wi-Fi? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and at the bare minimum, I would say yes. Uh, if, if you have to use a public Wi-Fi wi access point, either on an airplane, in a hotel, or at Starbucks, uh, VPN is a great way to reduce your risk. Um, but but I still encourage uh, individuals that that, that have uh, smartphones, especially for many organizations that, that have unlimited data plans on their accounts. Uh, it, it just makes sense to use those hotspots uh, that that are traveling along with you. All right, the next question, how do you see the streamlining of regulatory and compliance requirements being pushed across the state and federal and all the regulatory agencies? Uh, I don't. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of funny uh, that you asked that. I asked that same question two days ago uh, at the attorney's conference that I was at. And the attorneys actually highlighted something that I thought was very useful in that the state attorney general's offices have actually created a small market, if, if you will, in responding to consumer data theft, uh, in, in it, either through regulatory fines or uh, you know, public uh, flogging of firms within their states. And so on a, on a, on a, on a federal level, when you look at where, uh, from a political perspective, a lot of attorney generals go, they go to the federal space. Uh, and, and they either go you know, to the House, some of them run uh, for, the, for the Senate, things of that nature. And so uh, on a federal level, a lot of those individuals don't want to meddle with the states and create any kind of streamlined uh, ability because it, 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 it basically uh, removes the spotlight for the state level attorneys generals, right? It would, it would move it up, upstream to the SEC or the FTC or, or the OCC. And so, um, you know, the states want to have their own independent rights, if you will, around these, these laws. And so that, that's really driving a lot of the complexity. Um, from a streamlined perspective, though, the feedback that they did provide was even if you're not subject to some of these higher, more uh, comprehensive uh, state level requirements, uh, it, it's probably going to turn into best practice to adopt them anyway, because it will, you know, if you're doing uh, if you're meeting the requirements of, of the New York NYDFS right now, you would, you, you'd be meeting the requirements uh, across the United States. Um, and then in 2020, uh, as California's 
uh, data privacy law takes hold, and, and we didn't talk about it here in today's session, um, but it, essentially California has, has passed a law that's very much like the European uh, GDPR requirements. So again, if you're not in the state of California and not subject to it, even if you adopt it, um, you're, you're going to meet the, the requirements that are come after the fact, right? And so that's that's where a, a lot of the feedback and insight that we're giving and, and receiving is that look at where the, the quote unquote gold standards are in order to streamline your processes, but also create uh, your, your holistic incident response uh, plan that has the, the applicable contact numbers for the different groups that, that you need to reach out to once you have an incident, because many of the states have that 72 hour requirement or are looking at passing a 72 hour notification requirement. All right, it looks like those are all the questions we have. Again, um, as you mull through this information and, and uh, receive the, the slide deck and the recording, but if additional questions pop up, please do reach out to us. We wanna thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do put these webinars periodically on periodically for our, our clients and friends in the alternative investment space. So please be on the lookout for future webinars and, and white papers and, and other thought leadership to share. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today and look for that email with, uh, with the slide deck and recording and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.